So is it working on your side, Sam? Yep, I'm recording. Okay, brilliant. Um, Professor Sam Vaclin, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's an absolute privilege to have you on. Thank you for having me. It's very courageous of you. Um, first question, Sam, can you, um, can you give people a, a quick synopsis of who you are and your background? I used to be a businessman and an economic advisor to governments um, up until my mid-30s. And then owing to, um, owing to uh, some financial transactions gone awry, I became an early variant of, uh, of uh, the fame of Bernie Madoff. <laughs> and I ended, up, I ended up in prison. And of course, I've lost everything I, I had. Yeah. I had a $40 million empire. I had a wife. They noticed the, the order. <laughs> I had I had everything and I lost it. Mm -hmm. And then it drove me to, to self-inspect, to self-examine. Mm -hmm. I was driven into soul searching. And I discovered via the services of the prison psychiatrist, mm -hmm. an uh, ultra-Orthodox Jew, believe it or not, I mm -hmm. discovered the world of cluster B personality disorder. And so this is how I came, I came about this field. And as a prisoner, actually, mm. I was invited to give lectures on cluster B personality disorders in the criminology department of Tel Aviv University. So mm. I, would, I would be brought there in handcuffs and then I would be <laughs> uncuffed and I would give the lecture and I'd be driven back to the, to the prison. It was a very bizarre period. I've written malignant self-love, narcissism revisited in prison. Mm. And then immediately when I, you know, when it's ended, I um, placed it in its entirety online. And this was when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. It was 1995, 1997. And no one has heard of narcissism. Absolutely not. I mean, narcissism was an obscure niche in clinical psychology. The last meaningful book about narcissism from a scholarly point of view has been written in 1974 by Kohut. Mm. There was another popular book by Alexander Lowen, 1982. And it was it. You could find nothing online on narcissism. So my website was the first and for 10 years the only website on narcissism. Mm. I also um, was the first to describe narcissistic abuse. And I was faced with a lack of language. There was no language to describe these highly idiosyncratic and bizarre experiences, both internally as a narcissist and people around the narcissist. The narcissist, social milieu, friends, family. Now we call them victims because victimhood is all the rage. Mm. So we have relabeled these people victims. Mm. But there was no language and I had to come up with a language. So... The bulk of the language in use today, I coined it in the 1990s. Covert narcissism, was that one of yours? No. Covert narcissism was coined by Akhtar and Cooper in 1989. Yeah. But somatic narcissists, cerebral narcissists, mm. inverted narcissists, uh, no, con no contact, yeah. no contact, uh, and so on. These are yeah. all my inventions. I mean, uh, flying monkeys, all these, they're, they're, they're my inventions. Because I, there was no language, not because I'm such a brilliant guy. Well, I'm a yeah. brilliant guy, but there was also no language. <laughs> but you, so so you, you, you created the vernacular, the words, the language for uh, the profession, the psychiatry and, uh, and psychological profession to, to discuss no. and to develop. Yeah, no. Are you helped? No? no. What has happened is laymen have adopted mm. my language, mm. but it did not permeate or penetrate the, the halls of academe. Mm. So today there is a bifurcation, there's a kind of break, a chasm, mm. chasm between the two. There's an abyss between academic scholarly writing and thinking and studies of narcissism mm. and the online scene, and even I would say practitioners. So practitioners and people online and laymen and victims, and narcissists, and they have all adopted my language. Mm. But academics didn't. And so if you if you read academic studies and so on and so forth, you won't come across my language. Tell me, um, narciss narcissism right, is one of the four cluster B 
what they call the cluster B personality traits. What are they, Sam, and how does narcissism fit into that categorization? Cluster B personality disorders are mm. uh, also known as the dramatic or erratic disorders. They are disorders that are characterized either by extreme dysregulation and lability. So dysregulation of emotions, lability of moods, instability of life itself. Um, on the one hand, drama, drama queens, queenery, if you will, mm. on the one hand, or by a total lack of empathy and inability to conceptualize of other people as separate, external, and autonomous, or agentic. Agencies, agents in their own lives. Yes, so you have the two types coexisting mm. within cluster B, and this creates a lot of tension. Because, for example, what is common to the borderline and the psychopath? The borderline is heavily emotionally dysregulated. She she does possess, I'm saying she because until recently, majority of people with borderline personality disorder diagnosed were women. Mm. It was gender bias. Today we know that it's gender bias. It's not mm. clinically um, so supported. Yeah, so um, what's common between a borderline and a psychopath? A borderline is the, the anathema, the, the, the exact opposite of a psychopath. Mm. So they live uncomfortably. This diagnosis coexists uncomfortably within the cluster within cluster B. And even there are voices that advocate for a unification of all these personality disorders into a single diagnosis. And this actually is the case in the new edition of the International Classification of Diseases, ICD, which is the diagnostic manual that is prevalent and used outside the United States and Canada. The DSM is the United States and Canada, right? Mostly the United States. States. Yeah. Actually, mostly United States. No one is no one is no one uses the DSM outside the United States, actually. It's okay. uh you know, people use in China they use the they, they have their own DSM. Okay. It's it's called CCVD. In uh, in Russia they have their own DSM. The W the World Health Organization publishes the ICD, International Classification of Diseases, and this is the book that defines the field in 90% of the world. Mm. Um, but there are many who advocate to unify this. And in the, in the new edition of the ICD, the 11th edition of the ICD, this has been done. Mm. And you have a personality disorder, a single clinical entity with different manifestations and emphasis and overlays so that the same clinical entity can can express itself differently it's very similar to biology you could have a gene mm. and then this gene either is expressed or is not expressed mm. and depending on environmental cue it is either expressed in one way or in another way altogether mm. so the the, um, the, cost, the clinical entity of a, of a unitary single personality disorder is the equivalent of a field of poten potentials in physics. It's mm -hmm. like a field of potentials. And then it, uh, critical, it's critically dependent on environmental stimuli and cues. The environment determines how the personality disorder manifests or is observed. I'm just concerned, Sam, that from a, a diagnostic perspective, there could be cultural influences. So if you have one diagnosis in, in Russia, may not match with a diagnosis in the United States, et cetera, unless you have some kind of standardized book, if you like, of diagnostics, right? There are multiple massive problems mm. with the pseudoscience known as clinical psychology. Massive. Starting with the replication crisis, where well over 80% of studies cannot be replicated, which renders the whole field non-scientific. It cannot be replicated for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Then the next problem is under generation of hypotheses. The field does not generate generate testable, falsifiable hypotheses the way classical sciences do. I have a PhD in, in physics, by the way, so mm -hmm. I can compare. Mm -hmm. um, the third problem is uh, comorbidity. The fact 
that typically a patient is diagnosed with multiple personality disorders of the same cluster and of the same family, which is a powerful indication that something is wrong with the taxonomy. And then you have the polythetic problem. The polythetic problem is as follows. Mm. Um, to qualify or to, to be the happy owner of a personality disorder, you need to meet five of nine diagnostic criteria in the fourth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and mm. in the fifth edition, by the way. Mm. Now, here's the, here's the thing. If I were to meet criteria one to five and you were to meet criteria five to nine, mm. we would still be diagnosed with the same mental health problem, mm. even though we, share, we have nothing in common mm. or mm. one thing in common. Mm. And of course, this is ridiculous. The polythetic problem is is a massive problem. In, mm. in uh, does a spectrum? You, does, does, uh, does just let me. Let me, yeah, let me sorry. Just, I'm sorry that I I because you you've indicated one problem, mm. and it by it's by far not the most serious. Mm. It is a problem, admittedly, but it's not the most serious one. There are the, the problems that I mentioned are the serious ones. Now, mm. culture bound syndromes. What you describe is called culture-bound syndromes. The fact that uh, cultural cultural predilections, societal mores, value systems, um, gender gender bias, and so on. The fact that all these uh, predispose us to design diagnosis or to diagnose in a specific way. Yeah, that that is very true. Mm. That is quite true. But I wouldn't be as worried as you are. There is definitely a kernel. There is definitely a nucleus which is hard, hardwired and diagnosable all over the world. So someone with bipolar disorder presents the same in China, in Russia, in the United States. Someone with schizophrenia, same. A narcissist definitely presents the same in all these environments. The only exception with narcissism, for example, Mm -hmm. is that a narcissist would tend to express his narcissism in Japan via the collective. His narcissism would rest or be founded on his affiliation, on his allegiance to mm -hmm. a group. So he would say, uh, Toyota is the best car manufacturer in the world, and I'm working for Toyota. Mm -hmm. So that would be mm -hmm. a grandiose statement. Mm -hmm. Um while an American would say, I'm a, I'm a honcho in Toyota. I'm a, I'm, I'm a big wig in, in Toyota. I'm, mm. you know, I'm very powerful. I'm very, they can't manage without me and so on and so forth. So, mm. and that's because America is an individualistic culture and Japan has a collectivist culture. Mm. So, but these are differences. These are nuances. That's not the core. It so doesn't I will, limit I will um, diagnostically, though. It, it, it does, that doesn't... The cultural difference that doesn't limit you being able to offer a diagnosis. No. Right. No. Where there is um, a pronounced cultural effect or cultural problem mm. is in treatment, mm. not in diagnosis. In okay. diagnosis, I think culture bound syndromes and their pernicious effect is limited. Uh, but in treatment, that's a problem. Because in treatment, you do need to take into account multiple dimensions, not only of the diagnosis and but multiple dimensions of the person's existence, the person's life, including mm. social functioning, social networking, values, etc., etc. So if you approach a Muslim woman wrongly, then you're likely to scupper the, the treatment. You're likely to obtain very adverse outcomes. And you can't approach a Japanese narcissist as you would approach an American narcissist. You need to put different emphasis in the treatment. The issue, the even even classical issues like transference and counter-transference are very different when you are dealing with a Japanese patient and with an, an American or Russian patient, mm. and so on. So their cultural sensitivity is critical mm. in, in treatment. One of the things that um is quite interesting okay. in terms of the development of a, of a child uh, towards the adolescent stage and what we what i've heard and what i've read and i think it comes up in malignant self-love is um the child up to two years of age 
is consumed, if you like, with, nar is, is, with narcissistic tendencies. But at a certain point, they develop and they grow through that. They become less solipsistic. They take in people from e everywhere. They take in their mother, they take in the environment, and they kind of grow through it and grow out of it. But some don't. What is the percentage of people that struggle? Like, how many uh, extreme narcissists w w are we talking about in society as we move around in society? And what happens at that pivotal moment in, in, in youth? Depends how you define narcissism, pathological narcissism. Yeah. So there is a school, Theodore Millen, Lynn Sperry, others, there is a school that distinguishes between the disorder of narcissism, it's essentially a mental illness, and according to Otto Kernberg, a severe mental illness. I fully agree. I concur. And narcissistic style. Narcissistic style is narcissism light. Mm. It's having all these things, but not to the point of having of possessing a disorder, not to the point of affecting other people's lives in a manner which is irreversible and nefarious and destructive, and so on and so forth. Mm. In colloquial terms, being a jerk. Mm. being an a-hole mm. that that would qualify as a narcissistic style so people with narcissistic style plus people with narcissistic disorder comprise anywhere between five to seven percent of the population people with narcissistic personality disorder are about one percent of the population three percent in clinical settings in other words three percent among patients mm. clients one percent in the general general population and of these, only 3%, probably, we don't know for sure, but only 3%, around 3%, 5%, 10% at the maximum, are also psychopaths. So they are known as malignant narcissists. These are psychopathic narcissists. And they have, they have the best of both worlds. They are narcissists on the one hand, and they are psychopaths on the other. They have psychopathic behavior patterns. They're goal-oriented, they're defined, they're contumacious, they reject authority. They are reckless, um, they're violent, and external, externalize aggression, and so on and so forth. But they do all this in order to secure a regular flow of narcissistic supply. So whereas the classic psychopath, the run-of-the-mill psychopath, would pursue a variety of goals, sex, money, power, access, fame, celebrity, you name it. Mm -hmm. The narcissist is focused solely, exclusively on narcissistic supply, attention, adulation, affirmation, being feared, being notorious, any kind of attention. Yeah, even negative attention, right? Even negative attention is, is fully satisfactory as far as the narcissist is, is concerned. Mm. Now, I've, I've spent the last 10 years trying to recast all these disorders, perhaps with the exception of psychopathy, which I do not believe actually is a mental illness at all. I, I, I disagree that it is a clinical entity. Do you think it's an, a natural uh, uh, nature versus nurture phenomenon? It's, it's, it's First inbuilt. of all, there's, there's too much. There, there are genetic, a strong genetic, genetic yeah. component. There are brain abnormalities involved in psychopathy, which you cannot find in the other. Well, with the exception maybe of borderline to some extent. Mm. But more so, psychopathy is a social disease. Psychopathy mm. is defined as the person's interaction with society. The person's inability to fit in, to conform, and to function in society the way society expects the person to, to do. Mm -hmm. So this is a social problem, not a mental illness. A psychopath who so is someone who rejects the authority of the law, someone who rejects um, normal behavioral patterns and accepted norms, someone who is anomic, to use a sociological term, someone who has no norms, someone who is uh, ruthless and callous, goal-oriented, someone who has difficulty to conceptualize of other people as human, but treats them as objects, objectifies them, regards them as instruments, instrumentalizes mm -hmm. them, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. But none of this amounts to a mental illness. It's a, it's an attitude. I would even say it's a lifestyle choice. 
It's simply an attitude. And we have a similar problem with other diagnoses. For example, schizoid personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Schizoid personality disorder, which is not clustering. Schizoid personality disorder is someone who doesn't like people. He doesn't want to have sex, or she doesn't want to have sex. He, he doesn't want to go, he doesn't want to party. He doesn't want to go out. He doesn't want to meet people. He prefers to spend time alone, reading a good book, watching a, a great movie. That's pathological. And I'm not sure why. Well, it, we're primate species, right? And that would be very unusual for a primate species. You could species. say that it is abnormal. Mm. You could say that it, even if you want to introduce value judgment, you could say it's deviant. Mm. But these are statistical claims. This, this has nothing to do with mental illness. Mm. These are statistical claims. The schizoid is ecosyntonic. In other words, the schizoid is absolutely happy with the way he is. We don't have a problem here that the schizoid comes to therapy and says, I am really, really unhappy with myself, with my life choices, with the way I live, with my, I wish I were different. Mm. You would be hard pressed to find a schizoid who says, I wish I were different. And to a large extent, that's the case with a narcissist. Now we have a principle, we have an axiom in clinical psychology. If the patient is, if the person is functional, mm -hmm. and if the person is happy, content, we call it egosyntonic. Mm -hmm. If the person is content and functional, there is no mental illness. And definitely there is no call for intervention. There's no call for intervention, at least. We can disagree about mental illness, but there's no call for intervention. Mm -hmm. And what has been happening in the past 50 years or so is that psychiatry and psychology have become intrusive, patronizing, condescending, and domineering. And they have transgressed on this, on this dual axiom. So today, even if you come to, if, even if you find yourself in a clinical setting, a therapeutic setting, you are sent by the court to be evaluated. Mm. And you say, I'm perfectly happy with the way I am. And, you know, I'm a multi-billionaire and the president of the United States. Mm. You would still be subject to treatment. And that is completely wrong and very reminiscent of authoritarian regimes, such as in the, in the USSR, when dissidents were subjected to mental, uh, to psychological treatment, because to be a dissident means you're insane. Mm. You should be insane to be a dissident in the USSR. So, so you think we're, we're, we're too quick to prescribe and we're too quick to diagnose? I'm saying that psychology and psychiatry have become instruments of social control. They have transitioned from science, which they've never been, mm. to an instrument of social control. And today, psychology and psychiatry are widely used, sometimes voluntarily, sometimes a person volunteers, to be socially engineered, but today they are widely used to control individuals, collectives, collective behavior, and so on and so forth. And, the, and they have become punitive. Mm. They've become punitive. And to some extent, they've become danger, dangerous. For example, there's over, over prescription, over, there's medicalization based on nothing. And that includes neuroscience. The vast majority of studies in neuroscience are nonsense because the samples are exceedingly small. It's all correlation and not causation. Mm -hmm. And yet, psychiatry with its twin neuroscience and psychology, they pretend to be sciences and they administer drugs and they interfere with the brain directly or indirectly talk therapy is interference with the brain make no mistake about it. i we guess actually the... discovered we actually discovered a phenomenon called entraining and it's been it's been first described 10 years ago and and training is a situation where sound mm -hmm. synchronizes brain waves and so talk therapy and verbal abuse for example they mm -hmm. definitely have an impact on the brain which is hardware wetware impact not software either. I guess the, the argument from the psychiatric profession would be, listen, you know, there, there's a lot of people that are alive today that wouldn't be if, without our intervention. 
that would be... I am not aware of a single rigorous study that would support this. Mm, well, you know, um, neither am I off the top of my head, but I do think that is a a, a fair argument to make. It's a fair Different. argument to make if you can support it. I am mm. not aware of a single... How do you prove... How do you prove... Uh, well, you would have people who are coming to you with suicidal ideation, yeah. right? The fact that they, I mean, I can understand it's difficult if they stay alive th through a psychiatric or a psychological intervention, through talk therapy or through medication, they haven't gone through with the, with the, um, the ultimate, they haven't killed themselves. So it's very difficult. The overwhelming, the overwhelming vast majority of people with suicidal ideation and no intervention do not kill themselves. Mm. How do we, how does, how do we separate these populations? How do we establish a rigorous cohort mm. study? We can't. The answer is we can't, of course. So talking to people is very good. I mm. recommend. I recommend it. You should talk to your good friends. You should talk to your grandmother if she's still alive. You should talk to, you should talk to people, definitely. Mm. And talking to someone who has been exposed to people similar to you, also known as a psychologist mm. or a therapist, is an even better idea. I am not underestimating the capability of human communication to ameliorate and mitigate anxiety, depression, and so on and so forth. Mm. I am railing against their pretension to be a science. This is not a science by any extension of the word. Just recently, there was a gigantic meta-analysis that has proven, to my mind at least, very conclusively, that SSRI antidepressants are bullshit. Mm. Because serotonin is not the cause of depression. Mm. And SSRI mm. antidepressants, they were, they were the epitome and quintessence of the scientism of psychiatry. Mm. Like if you confronted a psychiatrist and said, psychiatry is not a science, it's a pseudoscience. He said, what are you talking about? Here, we, we've come up with SSRI antidepressants and they've saved millions of people. Mm. And now we are confronted with a meta-analysis of millions of people, which the whole thing is, is SSRI antidepressants have nothing to do with depression. They may have a placebo effect. Mm. I'm not under, underestimating a placebo effect. I'm not underestimating any of this. Witchcraft works for some people. So mm. does religion. Mm. Religion works for many more people than psychiatry and psychology combined. And are not underestimating the benefits of belief, of faith, and the placebo effects and nocebo effects. I'm not underestimating any of this. But to call this science is to degrade science and to lie. Simply to lie. Now, why would you lie? Because there's a lot of money in this. There's a lot of money in medication. There's a lot of money in the self-help industry, which is one giant scam. There's a lot of money in therapy, which is an equal scam. There's a lot of money in, in psychiatry and so on. It's simply mm -hmm. tens of billions of dollars. A great incentive to misrepresent many studies and, and so on. I guess the, 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 the counter argument would be, look at all the work that's done with say, addiction services. To help people um now we know that a lot of people with support can come out of addiction whether it's through fentanyl whether it's you know the, the really serious stuff the opiates alcohol but without support and without help and without that clinical intervention it's exceedingly more difficult i have no idea where you came with this nonsense from you don't think i i don't think maybe as opposed to you i don't think i rely on data Okay. Recidivism in rehab, and mm -hmm. I've spent 10 years in re rehab centers. Mm -hmm. Recidivism in rehab, the rate of recidivism within one year mm -hmm. is 81%. Okay. That means you go through rehab and you have an 81% chance to go back on your drug of choice, alcohol, what have you. Mm -hmm. If you, and that's one year, and we measure only one year recidivism only in one year. And you know why? Mm. Because if we were to measure five years, 
the rate would be almost 100%. So okay. rehab centers are the greatest conceivable scam, the greatest conceivable scam. And they combine talk therapy with medication, with, uh, you know, they have all the trappings of a science. There is no treatment in medicine, none, that is so poor. None, and that includes cancer. Mm. The only comparable thing is pancreatic and liver cancer. So if you were looking for a model, an interventionist model, to help from your perspective, where, where would you start then? If you're saying the rehab centers don't work. And... Rehab centers don't work, that's a fact. So how would you, where would you start by offering some help and some treatments to say people that are in the grips of severe addiction, right? Are you saying no intervention and no rehab centers, no clinical? Definitely intervention. Okay. You should provide them with clean needles. You should provide them with drug substitutes. You okay. should provide them with kits for overdose against okay. to counter overdoses. Of yeah. course, you should intervene. You should well, that's intervene. more, that intervention is more of a supporting and enabling as opposed to um it's preventing preventing the adverse outcomes of drug addiction overdoses yeah. for example because there's nothing you can do about it and anyone who tells you that there is something you can do about drug addiction mm. is lying to you through its teeth through its teeth it's a lie it's not even a myth it's a straightforward lie you don't have to trust me once this program is over, go online, check, mm. check recidivism, recidivism rates for rehabs. Yeah, I have, I do have, I have looked at this anecdotally. I don't have the stats in front of me. Um, what I, I heard that recidivism in the first year was 90%, was higher than 81%. Actually, it's 81. But because it's... Uh, 81, I mean, for all, all substance abuse disorders. Mm. Mm. It's true that uh, alcoholism, for example, is 80%. And some other types of drugs are close to 100. Mm -hmm. So when you mm -hmm. average them, it's about 81%. 81 mm -hmm. is bad. 81 mm -hmm. is seriously bad. This is the remission rate in pancreatic and liver cancer, which are the two deadliest forms of cancer and have no cure. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is seriously bad. Is, we yeah. don't know what is addiction. We have had the nonsensical hypothesis of addictive personality, which has now been luckily, finally discarded. We have not, we don't have a clue what is an addiction. We know, of course, that addiction changes biochemical reactions in the brain, pathways, creates new pathways, and we, we know. We have fMRIs, we have nice toys, we like to play with these toys, they're very colorful, you know, mm. and they impress the layman. And they, it's good that they impress the layman because laymen pay taxes, and then you can get grants and you can live the rest of your life off the grants. Mm. This is the way science works, so-called science works. So, but the truth is we have no idea what is addiction. Actually, a few years ago, when I was still involved with, with uh, on the right side of drugs and alcohol, I mean, in the rehab side, I suggested in, in a series of uh, peer-reviewed articles, I suggested that addiction is actually a positive thing. And the reason I suggested it is because about one third of the brain is geared to tackle addictions. It's as if we have a machine here that is built to generate addictions <clears throat> and then to manage them. Now, why, from the point of view of evolution, why would we end up with a brain whose possibly main task is addiction? Like, the addiction areas in the brain, for example, the dopaminergic uh, pathway, so the addiction areas are about 10 times larger than the areas that deal with language. Broca's organ and so on. If you put all the areas that deal with language, they mm -hmm. are 10% of the areas that deal with addiction. Why? If addiction was a bad thing, a horrible thing and so on, why mm -hmm. would our brain, why do we have receptors why do we have receptors for cannabinoids and endorphins and, yeah. and why? So I suggested mm. that actually addiction is a positive thing, not a negative thing. It's something involved in learning, in attachment, in bonding, 
Love is a form of addiction, clearly. There is definitely an addictive process between newborn and mother. And now I'm talking biology, not psychology. There's no psychology at this age. Mm. So it seems that addiction predisposes us to social connections, on the one hand, getting attached and bonded, not only to human beings, but also to objects or whatever. And then, of course, some people are going to misuse it. Of course, some people are going to abuse this mechanism. As they, some people abuse, abuse reading. They read too much. Some people abuse, I don't know, watching, well, well, like, binge, well, like, binge watching. Yeah, well, like, well, I guess some pastimes are constructive. Um, some are not. The If you were to add up all of the potential addictions that people suffer from, right? So you have food, sex, you've got um, all of the negative stuff, drugs, alcohol, porn. You could be looking at over 85, 90% of the general population, at least in Western society. Yes. I mean, you, you, you could even be getting close to, not, to 100. Everybody has something. So I, I, I take your point. Right, I take your point that there does seem to be some kind of biological wiring in there that predisposes us to pursue, maybe in an obsessive, compulsive way, but then you could argue that that gives us the human drive to, is related to the human drive to achieve. Like, how would you get a man on the moon if why somebody you, wasn't why obsessed? Would you get, why would you get a man on the moon? Yeah. That's, precisely, that's precisely the issue. Not how, but why. Mm. It's precisely the issue. I agree with you fully. Today, maybe 100% of the population are addicted one way or another. Some addictions are more benign than others. Benign, yeah. But overall, I agree. Why? Because we have created a civilization that encourages addictions. So environment is at, at the core of addiction. We have, we, we incentivize, we have mm. a set of incentives that encourages addiction. For example, consumerism. Food. What we food. put into food, additives in food, I mean, that's a whole podcast additives, by itself. Social, social media, mm. co consumerism, mm. these are all forms of addiction. Mm. So it seems that we have chosen addiction as mm. the main mode of existence, as an existential mode. Mm. It doesn't mean that addiction is bad. It, it means that collectively we are mm. making bad use of it. Mm. So... Uh, but can we define addiction by saying that addiction only really becomes addiction when it's outside of our control? When, yes. the, when what we're doing is we are not in control of the pastime. Yes, and it's then not it, a bad thing. Yeah. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. For example, I don't think a baby is in control of his addiction to his mother. Mm. Uh, or, mm. And vice versa, by the way, it's a mutual addiction. I don't think mm. it's a bad thing at all. In, mm. in itself, it's not a bad thing. Mm. Of course, if you make it an organizing principle of life mm. and also a principle that imbues life with meaning makes sense of life mm. because the junkie you know I, i've worked with junkies the junkie so uh, yeah well a junkie regards his addiction as an organizing principle and mm. the addiction provides him with a with an agenda a timetable a goal uh, you know, it becomes it becomes his Bible. It becomes his his raison d'être. Um, addiction helps him to socialize. Addiction has massive social dimensions, mm. and addiction, of course, has psychological components. And of course, in due time, it affects the brain. It's very difficult to reverse, and and so on and so forth. So, addiction is a complex, such a complex phenomenon that to reduce it to a sentence like uh, we can treat it. I think is counterproductive and counterfactual. Mm. I don't think we have a clue what is addiction. And we're beginning. In 100 years' time, we may have. Right now, we don't have. Mm. Um, I, I, I suspect environment, we will, we will discover over time that environment um, and people's personal lives play a greater part in the behavior than we would have. Um, it's like the famous study of the American GIs coming back from Vietnam. You, you know about this study, right? Um, a lot of them are using opioids on a daily basis. They get out of the environment, they come back to the United States, um, and 85, over 85% of them just stopped using 
heroin, right? The people that were using it on a daily basis. And it was it's clearly an environmental impact. But that's what you just said. I said yeah. we've constructed a civilization mm. that incentivizes, rewards, mm. positively reinforces, if you mm. want to use a con concept from behaviorism, mm. positively reinforces addiction. Mm -hmm. mm. Addiction is cued by the environment. Addiction is a response to signaling. And when you get the right set of rewards and positive reinforcements, mm. then you choose. It's a choice. You choose to be. How do I know that addiction is a choice? Because I have seen the most god-awful addicts. Give it up in a day. Literally. Literally. If this were really a brain disease, if this were really something biological and neurological and so on, you could not give it up in a day. Addiction is absolutely a choice. From 10 years of exposure to this field, I'm absolutely convinced it's a choice. However, of course, it's a choice that has impacts on the brain. But it's a choice that is, I agree with you fully, environmentally cued. It's a reaction to the environment. If you were, if you live in Saudi Arabia, you're extremely unlikely to become an alcoholic. Of course, everyone, you could drink in secret and end up being decapitated or something. Mm -hmm. But but you're very unlikely to become an alcoholic mm. because you're not exposed to alcohol bottle, bo alcohol in bottles. You're not exposed to visuals. You're not exposed to advertising. You're not exposed to your friends drinking and offering you a drink. You're not exposed to bars. You're not a... Clearly, mm. the environment conditions you to not be an alcoholic exactly mm. as it conditions you to be an alcoholic. Mm. Same goes when it comes to sex addiction, for example. Same goes. Same. I think all addictions are. Um, Pornography is a particularly pernicious one because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Which um, pornography is pornography. a particularly pernicious one because it, the damage it's going to it's it's going to have on pair bonding relationships. Here, there's a, a, a bit of a problem with the science. We still don't have studies that conclusively demonstrate that there is addiction to pornography. Mm. So. Well, I understand what you're saying, and I have come across people who can't stop, which is the test of addiction. Mm. You can't stop. You really want to stop, and you can't stop. I've come across such people. I've come even across people who damage their genitalia, masturbating and so on. Mm. So probably it is an addiction. I'm not disputing this. But at this stage, there's no foundation. There's no scientific foundation. Mm. There are no studies that corroborate it. What is clear, and there, of course, uh, there are studies by Zimbardo and many others. What is clear is that pornography shapes the way people who are exposed to pornography regard sex, sexuality, sexual interactions, sexual orientations, mm -hmm. and permissible and, and impermissible acts in, in sex, etc., etc. So shapes what we call sexual scripts. Mm -hmm. Until the 1950s and 1960s, sexual scripts were handed down from one generation to the next. A sexual script tells you how to flirt, how to have what is allowed in sex and what is not allowed in sex, what mm. constitutes coercion and rape and what doesn't, how to interact with the with the other party and so on. So this is mm. known as a sexual script. Today, the sexual script is determined by peers, peers and pornography, the two peers, mm. peers and pornography. Mm. And peers derive their scripts from pornography, so ultimately pornography. Mm. And today, when young people go to a room to have a one night stand, they reenact pornographic acts. So that's why, for example, choking, choking has been described in well over 80% of one night stands under the age of 25. Similarly, anal sex is now more predominant. Than vaginal sex in one night stands in heterosexual in heterosexual you, you, you couples, couples among age group under under 25. Why? Because anal sex and choking is these are porn porn uh, tropes. These are you know, see them on, on Pornhub. Mm. And of course, the objectification of the and I'm talking, I'm limiting myself to heterosexual sex. Mm. Of course, the objectification of the woman. Um, 
and to some extent dehumanization of the woman. About 10% of women report having had an orgasm in a one night stand compared to 53% of men. So it's like the man is using the woman's body to masturbate. With. Yeah. Um, and so on. So all this is, is pornography. Yeah. Let me ask you a kind of a, a legislative you know, you know one, question. Uh, just one thing which yeah. I think would, would interest your, your viewers. Yeah. The problem with pornography is this the human mind, the human brain, I'm sorry, cannot tell the difference between three dimensional flesh and blood visuals and two dimensional visuals on the screen. Mm. That's a fact. The brain wow. cannot tell the difference. So when the brain is exposed mm. to two dimensional pictures, moving pictures on a, on a screen, the brain has had sex. The brain believes that it, it has had sex. It's, it, it's not taking in the physical sense of the touch, the, the third dimension. It's not, it's it not has, incorporating it has, that? Not really. The, mm -hmm. And that's why men, for example, are the main consumers of pornography. Mm. And also men are titillated and aroused by visuals, mm. while women are titillated and aroused by text. Story. Story, narrative, mm. text, mm. and so on. Mm. So if you, say, if you say to a woman something nice, if, you, if you're nice to a woman, if you, if, you, if you have a way with words, if you're eloquent, you're much more likely to get in her pants, sorry for the expression, than if you're a hunk. Mm. But a man would be attracted to a looker. Yeah. Yes, to a good looking. Let, let me ask, this might be outside uh, your remit, but for, from a philosophical legislative point of view, if you were asked, pardon me, should we ban hardcore pornography, not just for under 18s? I have a, a, a Dr. Richard Hogan, uh, one of my former guests, is launching a campaign to suppress the proliferation of pornography for under 18s. And I was thinking about it, just banning it wholesale. What would your perspective be? Would it create a black market? Would you go, yes, listen, this, this, this offers no value to society whatsoever. Let's just get rid of it completely. The problem is that there's no sex education. Mm. The only sex education available is through pornography. In, mm. the, in the United States, for example, there's no sex education. Mm. And whatever sex education there is, it's rudimentary. It's, it doesn't tackle problems that young people face. It's a, so they use pornography as a teaching moment, an instrument. So you think improved sex education would offset the damage, the societal damage by pornography? Unboundary sex education. Sex mm. education where you're allowed to talk about anything and everything. And mm. you're going to get authoritative answers from non-blushing adults. Mm. People need to grow up. People need to mature. <laughs> Pardon me. No, don't worry. I... Another thing uh, in conjunction mm. with this is that, yeah, of course it will create a black market. Prohibition. Mm. 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 You prohibit something, there's immediately a market for it. Drugs, mm. alcohol, I mean. Mm. So it's, while maybe ethically and so on, it's, it's a good idea, mm. um, it, it won't work. Mm. Won't work. People will consume pornography illegally, like they do today on the dark web and so on. You have mm. types of pornography that you can consume only on the dark web. Mm. Snuff pictures, for example. Mm. Not real, they're simulated, but never mind. Snuff mm. pictures, only on the dark web. You can't see. Uh, real incest. Forget what you get via Google. That's not real incest. But mm. you do have real incest pornography on the dark web in real time sometimes. Mm. You have philia on the dark web. They are prescribed. They're illegal. You could go the rest of your life to prison for some of these things. And yet they're available. What's a dark web? You have a, a Tor browser, you're in the dark web. So there's no intervention um, really that we could make that would stop somebody who's... It would stop people who are less determined, if you like. You can't stop people who are wholeheartedly determined to get access to that kind of stuff. But you would stop people inadvertently falling um, into it. Um, let me ask you about um, narcissism. There's a couple of people, questions. People, I want people to... are pretty determined when it comes to pornography. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, in what professions uh, 
in your experience, are we most, we touched on this already, but I just want to go, sorry, go back. Are we most likely to see a preponderance of narcissists, right? I'm thinking, I mean, the, the exhibitionist professions, I'm thinking filmmaking, I'm thinking acting, I'm thinking, um, what about the corporate space? Yes. Actually, the corporate space is the only space where we have studies. Mm -hmm. We do not, believe it or not, have studies with regards to actors, the entertainment industry, show mm. business, mass media, social media. Mm. Uh, we have studies with regards to the medical profession, and we have mm. studies with regards to um, corporate settings. Mm. We don't have a single study about therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. Mm. Tells you a lot. So we don't know how many, what percentage of psychiatrists, therapists, psychologists. No. Um, right, that's, that's really interesting. And even worse, mm. to obtain a degree in psychology or psychiatry, you don't need to pass any mental health tests. You mm. can be a raving lunatic, dangerous mm. to yourself and to others, mm. and end up treating people. You could be unboundaried. For example, you could be a borderline. What is the Hannibal Lecter? Um... Case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's real. It's factual. Mm, you mm, could be Hannibal Lecter and mm, treat people. So, and this is, of course, a guild, guild approach. You know, it's a monopoly. Mm, and when there's a monopoly, a professional monopoly, and when there's a monopoly, uh, standards are lowered and or non-existent. Mm, of course, someone who intends to become a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist before starting the first year must be screened for a variety of mental health issues. Starting, mm. I mean, psychotic disorders, personality disorders, mood disorders. Some of them are seriously dangerous. Seriously dangerous. So today it's a Russian roulette. You attend therapy with someone, you have no idea how boundary it is, how violent it is, how aggressive it may be. Will he blackmail you? Will he rape you? You can't tell. Simply you can't tell. It's a Russian roulette. But in corporate settings, it seems that narcissists and psychopaths are overrepresented uh, by 500% compared to the general population. So 3 to 5%, for example, mm. of chief executive officers of Fortune 500 have been diagnosed with psychopathy and or na malignant narcissists. But how would you get CEOs to take, I, I presume that's the hair test, right? How would you get the hair, to... the hair and baby? It's, these are studies by hair and baby to people. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. They they were administered the PCLR, the PCLR designed by Robert Hare. Mm. They, they attention, they're narcissists. What do you mean? <laughs> they, yeah, but yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exclusive yeah, yeah. study. They're part of history. <laughs> they're part of history. Okay, so we're saying three to five percent of CEOs, and in the general population, we're it's saying about one. It's about, about one percent. Similarly, among surgeons, which yeah. is the only segment of the medical profession to have been studied. Mm. the preponderance of psychopathy is much higher than in the general population. There is even a famous, I think, neurosurgeon or neuroscientist, Fallon, who, who has been diagnosed with psychopathy and outed himself, mm. admitted that he's been diagnosed with psychopathy. <laughs> mm. So we have a case study. And there was a very famous play David Mammoth wrote. Um, it was converted into a movie called Malice. And it's, it, he talks about the God complex with, with the surgeon. Right, and the, oppor the 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 opportunity to play God, a life and death with somebody's at your hand, at your fingertips, and that's that's part of the attraction. There is this, and there is the fact that you have to cut someone. Mm. <laughs> I mean, uh, wow! I mm. don't know if uh, you can do it. Do you I think mean, corporate? Do uh, you think corporate culture rewards and incentivizes um, potentially psychopathic, sociopathic behavior? There's a school in uh, psychology nowadays, in academic psychology. There's mm. a school. Kevin Dutton, Maccoby, many others. Mm. They, they focus on what they call high-functioning narcissists. Mm. These are narcissists who are beneficial to society. They're pro-social, they're communal. They're beneficial to society because they're daring. They're risk-takers. Um, they lack empathy, which is good when you are, for example, a soldier or a mm. surgeon or a corporate executive who has to fire 5,000 people, mm. or whatever. So mm. they lack empathy. Everything that seems to be wrong with narcissism, uh, in certain settings and environments, is actually a positive adaptation. That's the idea. 
And so evolutionary psychology, school in psychology, evolutionary psychology suggests that narcissism did not just, it's not a mutation, a, a bad mutation. It's not just an accident, a bad accident, but on the mm. very contrary, it's a positive adaptation that was carried forward through the generations because it has, it has had some value or benefit to survival, survival value. Mm. So, and indeed narcissists, because they are so hell-bent on obtaining narcissistic supply and garnering attention and so on, narcissists are creative. Hans Eising suggested the quality of psychoticism, mm. which, is a, which in, includes an element of creativity. Mm. He said that creative people, actually a kind of psychotic, it's not exactly psychotic, but like a bit psychotic. So... And uh, but what I might dispute that the, the creative people tend to be highly empathetic by nature. Some, some, and, and some. I, I wouldn't generalize in this mm. in this way. Unfortunately, I cannot. I cannot kind of participate in this dialogue. I cannot be your interlocutor because I don't have data. Mm -hmm. um, anecdotal, maybe, but I don't have data. Anecdotally, anecdotally, I'm, I, I have worked a little bit, and I, I do find that the, the warmth and the empathetic nature of, of, of the listen I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an awarded uh, author of short fiction mm -hmm. in in hebrew in israel awarded i won israel's second most pre prestigious award of literature mm -hmm. um and i don't have uh, a hint of empathy a trace of empathy i'm clinically a psychopathic narcissist so i wouldn't generalize Mm. Definitely not based on anecdotes. That's what that is what science is for. Mm, mm, mm. We gather no, data, I, we arrange, classify mm. it, and we, you know, mm. but we don't have science here. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, I so. accept it. Accept it. Um, it is a massive generalization. So, okay, so we're saying that um, in the corporate space, we'll say three to five. We're saying three to five percent generally. That's the only place we have data because it hasn't been and surgeons, medical and surgeons. surgeons. Yeah. And we we know that we were saying the general population is one percent or less, about one percent. Yeah. Um. Okay. So, what what I want to ask you about is strategies in dealing with narcissists, right? Actually, before I do that, can I ask you what the difference is between a, a psychopath and a sociopath? Sociopath is not a clinical term, mm. although it's it is used in academic literature here and there. Mm. It's not a clinical term. Mm. Not, not a rigorous. By the way, psychopath is not a clinical term. You will it's not find the word. You will not find the word psychopath in the diagnostic and statistical manual, and not because they haven't considered it. Mm. Successive committees over forty years, four zero, mm. have considered the inclusion of psychopathy in the DSM and have rejected it because they reach a conclusion it's not a rigorous clinical entity. So psychopathy and sociopathy are hype media hype and to some extent academic hype and again there's a lot of money in this mm. robert hare became a multi-millionaire by selling by licensing the pclr especially to corporations so he has an incentive he's no longer an unbiased scientist mm. he has an incentive to propagate and perpetuate the diagnosis of psychopathy in the so, APD, the Antisocial Personality Disorder, is yes. that the, the, the umbrella term for them? Yes, Antisocial Personality Disorder, in its most extreme end of the spectrum, is allegedly psychopathy. Okay. But you could have Antisocial Personality Disorder people who are not psychopaths, and there is work by Martha Stout, mm. for example, the sociopath next door, um, and she describes run-of-the-mill pedestrian psychopaths who are not serial mm. killers, and mm. they are not, you know, just your neighbor. Now, sociopath is someone who, well, the distinction is, so, is, is sociopath is someone who is socially and culturally um, rebellious, defiant, again, contumacious, rejects authority, refuses to fit in, refuses to conform. It used to be called in the 19th century uh, social character disorder. Mm. Social social character illness or sickness mm. disease. Mm. So it, it's sociopath is is a lot more relational. It's not the individual, but the individual's interactions are somehow abnormal, dysfunctional, or problematic to other people. 
I would say that a sociopath is defined by the impact that he has on other people, rather than by anything innate. Mm. A psychopath, on the other hand, is supposedly a clinical entity in the sense that even if a psychopath were to be totally isolated on a, on a cell or an island, he would still be a psychopath. Mm. He would still be, for example, defined. He would defy, he would defy nature. He would still be contumacious. He would spit on God. He would still be reckless. He would do crazy things and endanger his life and the life of others, if there are others. But even if he were totally isolated, you would, could immediately tell he's a, he's a psychopath. Mm. If you were to isolate a sociopath, mm. sociopathy would vanish in the absence of other people. The context. It's a contextual mm. problem. Mm. Contextual mm. disorder. Where psychopath doesn't depend on context. Narcissism, for example, is a contextual disorder. When you isolate the narcissist from potential sources of narcissistic supply mm. and from potential partners in the shared fantasy, by the way, a key feature of narcissism, which we haven't mentioned. Mm. So if you isolate the narcissist from other people who are relevant, significant participants, collaborators in principle, mm. he ceases to be a narcissist. For example, when you place narcissists in prison, mm. they are no longer narcissistic. They are no longer narcissists. They don't behave as narcissists. They develop empathy. They are not, they don't, they have positive impact on other people and so on and so forth. Why? Because if you are a narcissist in prison, it affects your longevity or health. Mm. Usually both. Mm -hmm. So the narcissist is a major incentive in prison to mm. stop being a narcissist. Mm. And suddenly he's not. I know mm. because I did time mm -hmm. and I've been able to observe myself and many other narcissists because prisons are flooded with narcissists and psychopaths flooded and yet in all my time there mm. I have never come once across an expression or manifestation of narcissism not once I haven't come across disempathy I haven't come across criminal or antisocial acts I have it not once. It's pretty amazing. In prison. In prison. Because in prison, the sanction, the price, mm. the cost of being a narcissist mm. is unacceptable. So mm. you stop being a narcissist. Mm. In other words, it's a contextual mm. relational disorder. That's why I don't think these are clinical entities, really. Mm. <clears throat> I think the only clinical entity in cluster B is border. Yeah. It also means that it's not immutable. It's not genetic, um, and mm. it's not it. It's it creates it, it's pathological in that it's diseased, but a disease can be cured. No, I'm sorry that if I give it's my fault if I give the wrong impression. What mm. happens in prison is behavior modification. Okay, the disease or the disorder doesn't go away. Okay, it's just that the narcissist is able to modify his behavior to the point that he is no longer diagnosable. As a narcissist, we call this subclinical narcissism. Mm. Have you heard of the dark triad? I assume you did. Yeah. So that in dark triad, again, self-styled experts online misrepresent the dark triad. Dark triad is not narcissism or psychopathy. Dark triad is subclinical narcissism, subclinical psycho psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. So in dark triad, there's someone. Mm -hmm who cannot be diagnosed as a narcissist, although we know that he has narcissistic traits and behaviors and so on, mm -hmm. but he cannot be diagnosed. And similarly, he cannot be diagnosed with psychopathy, but he's manipulative, he's Machiavellian. Narcissists, when they enter prison, become subclinical narcissists. It's a fascinating transition. And it means that most, if not all, the behaviors of the narcissist, which are abrasive, antisocial, hurtful, harmful, all these behaviors can definitely be suppressed, modified, eliminated even. If the prison term is 10 years, they're eliminated effectively. And it's adaptive to the environment. Yes. Uh, it's so would it return then when the, when the prisoner is released? Would it yes. organically just naturally return when, the, when they go back into society? Yes, it would. That's what I'm saying. The disease yeah. is there. Mm. Disorder is there. Mm. 
It's just that it is repressed to the point that it is no longer diagnosable. Mm. We have a similar situation with some therapies. For example, we have dialectical behavior therapy, mm. DBT. Dialectical behavior therapy is a therapy of choice for borderline personality disorder. And it's amazing. Mm. It teaches the borderline to regulate her emotions, to control her impulses, to, to stabilize her moods. It's stunning. It's the most successful therapy there is, by the way, statistically speaking. 50% of people treated with DBT lose the borderline personality disorder diagnosis in one year and never regain it. And we're not, there's no chemical intervention here. There's no oh, prescript. There's nothing. It's all. There's a individual therapy and group therapy. That's all. And 50% lose the diagnosis and never regain it. It has a 50% success rate. Just to give mm. you an indication, that's five times the success rate of CBT, which is the hallowed. The sacred uh, preservative therapy. So it's amazing. It's an amazing therapy. By the way, developed by a patient, mm. developed by someone who, who has had borderline personality disorder. She started to develop it in a mental asylum. Amazing story. Now she's a psychologist, but she started as a, as a patient. So when you administer DBT, the person can no longer be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder because she has learned behavioral techniques. She has learned to manipulate herself, to modify her behaviors, to control them somehow, mm. to channel them, to sublimate them, to render them socially acceptable, and so mm. on. But it doesn't mean she's not a borderline anymore, actually. The critical core dynamics, psychodynamics, they're there. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely there. And so when we're trying to explain to clients or patients, if you go to DBT, you no longer have this, 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 and this. But everything else will remain. For example, you continue to feel empty. Mm -hmm. There's a problem of emptiness in borderline. Not only in borderline, in narcissism as well. Oh. It's known as the schizoid empty core. You'll mm -hmm. continue to feel empty inside. Mm -hmm. And this cannot be tackled in any way, shape, or form. Same with the narcissist. The narcissist continues to feel grandiose. He continues to, have, to, to hold everyone in contempt. He continues to feel superior. He continues to feel discriminated against and victimized. It's all this continues. Mm. Only you can't say this in prison. If you hold someone in contempt and you meet him in the showers later, mm -hmm. it's going to end badly. Mm -hmm. So um, more contempt. If somebody, I want to ask you from, from a gender perspective, right? First, I want to ask you about if a young woman uh, is, is embarking upon a relationship with a man, and she thinks everything is going great. She's found this. She's loved this guy. He's fantastic. But there's something she feels is not right. How could that young woman, um, or any woman, what's the checklist for her to, to try and figure out, is this guy potentially a narcissistic abuser? What would your perspective be? And then I want to ask you from the male perspective. In 1970, there was a, Japanese, of course, Japanese, roboticist. And he came up with the concept of uncanny valley. Masahiro, Masahiro Mori was his name. He suggested that as robots become more and more human-like, as they become, as they become androids, mm -hmm. we are going to develop an extreme feeling of unease in their presence. Not because they don't resemble humans, but because they, be they have become indistinguishable from humans. And yet something in us, gut feeling, intuition, instinct, call it what you want, something in us is going to signal to us, this is not a full-fledged, fully baked human. Something is off key. Mm. Some note is wrong in this symphony. And, and he called it the uncanny valley. valley. Um, when you come across a narcissist or a psychopath, regardless of the setting, you are likely to have an uncanny valley reaction. You're likely to react to the narcissist psychopath as if they were not fully human, not fully composed, not full-fledged, not fully put together or put together wrongly, or there's an off key or something. You know. And it's going to know at you. It's going to, you know. It's an intuitive thing. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. We know, for example, that when two people meet, they exchange a gigantic amount of information via, via smell. They exchange about 100 items 
via smell alone, mm. including the composition of the immune system, uh, many of the genetic properties and so on and so forth are exchanged within a split, a microsecond, on a first encounter of less than two meters distance. Wow. So a lot of information is being exchanged. Body language, of course, micro expressions, mm. facial expressions, the way I the way I comb my hair. I mean, a lot, a mm. lot is exchanged. Some argue that the vast majority of information is exchanged non-verbally on a first encounter. That's why first impressions. You know. So, so what you're saying, Sam, is for a young woman or any woman is really trust your innate instincts, yes. your your intuition as yes. the number one reference yes. point. A hundred percent. And so, but this is the first line of defense. Mm. This is the Maginot line, and then start to observe. Mm. Is he? breaching your boundaries does he treat you as an extension of himself does he make decisions for you on the first date he orders drinks without consulting you or he chooses a restaurant or he you know he decides mm -hmm. what you're going to do during the evening you're going to watch a movie now you know so that's a breach of boundaries and ignoring your autonomy uh, agency and independence mm -hmm. Second thing, and by far the most critical, how does he treat others? Mm. Because with you, it's an act. Mm. Narcissists interact with, with potential intimate partners in a sequence that is kabuki sequence. It's mm. rigid, it's dictated, and it's never changing, immutable. So the first thing they do is they love bomb. Love bombing starts subtly, the way he looks at you, the way... So with you, it's an act. You can't mm. trust the information that you gather by being with the narcissist on the first date. Instead, monitor and observe how the narcissist relates to other people. So the waiters at the table, other the waiter, people as the you cab driver, yeah. The, mm. yeah. How does yeah. he? Because there, he won't bother to act. But he there's nothing to gain from them. So obviously, he'll show his true self, if you like. N moreover. Yeah. The underlings and subordinates and service providers mm. provoke, trigger the narcissist's grandiosity, his worst features. Mm. Narcissists are, in this sense, a bit sadistic. Mm. So this provokes his worst features. Similarly, pay attention to what happens in stressful situations, when things don't go right, somehow. Does he become paranoid? Does he become aggressive? Does he curse? Does he break things? Does he... Pay a lot of attention to that. Mm. His speech patterns, speech patterns are crucial. Narcissists are not really interested in other people. They want to talk about themselves. Or mm. when they pretend to listen to you, they're planning their next their next performance. You know? mm. So he's likely suddenly to ask a question, the answer to which you've already provided. He was simply not listening. He's likely to to talk about himself, his work, his accomplishments, his brilliant future, and so on and so forth. I'm doing this to you in this interview, actually. My speech patterns are, to some extent, disrespectful. So it's an indicator of narcissism. These are enough. On a How point. do you mean, Sam? How? Give me an example in this interview specifically. I am leveraging you to say what I want to say. I know that. And that's typical in an interview, in any mm -hmm. interview, up to a point. Mm -hmm. And beyond that point, it's disrespectful. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I don't disrespect you because I think you're unintelligent. I actually think you're intelligent. So there you have my respect. But I disrespect you because you're a tool. Mm -hmm. You're an instrument. You have no separate external existence. Narcissists are not capable of perceiving the externality and separateness of other people because they've never been able to separate from the maternal figure and individuate. Mm -hmm. Narcissism is a failure in separation individuation. Mm -hmm. So they are still symbiotically enmeshed in a, with a maternal figure in their mind and they relate to other people the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, we are one now. And of course, because we are one now, you are not external, you're not separate from me. Because mm. we are one now, and because clearly I'm superior to you, then you are my tool, mm. my instrument. My so, uh, 
what else from from uh, from a female perspective? I think we know we understand what a woman, a young woman, should be looking for. Is there anything else before we switch it to the male perspective? Yes, the alacrity, the alacrity of the process. Okay, he would want to marry you on a second date and have, and plan having th on having three children with you on the third date. Okay, the speed. It's abnormal. It's unnatural. We want to move in, move in with you by the end mm -hmm. of the first day. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. common occurrence, by the way. Mm -hmm. Move in with you on the first day. Join bank accounts, whatever. Uh, the speed. The speed mm -hmm. should alarm you seriously. Mm -hmm. The narcissist relates to potential intimate partners via a process known as shared fantasy. It was first described by Sander in 1989. Mm. The shared fantasy, in the shared fantasy, the narcissist creates a script, the equivalent of a theater play or a movie. Mm. And then he casts you. It's type, it's casting, casting central. He mm. casts you in a role. And you're supposed to play the, this role within the fantasy. Now, mm. within the fantasy, you idealize each other. The narcissist first idealizes you. And because you will have become ideal, it idealizes him. Mm. He's in possession of an ideal object, you. Only an ideal person can possess an ideal object. So that makes him ideal. And this process is known as co-idealization. And then the shared fantasy progresses into, into its inevitable conclusion, which is devaluation, separation, devaluation, uh, devaluation, separation, individuation. So mm -hmm. the narcissist converts you into a maternal figure. By the way, even in same-sex relationships, even when the narcissist is a woman, mm -hmm. The narcissist converts the intimate partner into a maternal figure because the narcissist wants to reenact the early conflict with the biological original mother and wants to separate from them and become an individual, wants to grow up through the agency of the intimate partner. So the intimate mm. partner becomes a mother and then the narcissist needs to push her away and the only way he knows how to do this is to devalue her and then he separates from her and discards her. This process is autonomous, automatic, and ineluctable. There's absolutely nothing you can do. If you're the best conceivable partner, most loving and caring and empathic and holding, you name it, you sacrifice yourself, you're codependent, you, you're a doormat. Nothing is going to help because the narcissist needs to devalue you and separate from you because you are his mother, you're his new mother. Of course, the narcissist gives you the same treatment. He becomes your mother. He provides you with con unconditional love. He regresses you to a much earlier age. And that is why this whole relationship is, apropos our earlier conversation, is addictive. The partner doesn't fall in love with the narcissist. The partner falls in love with herself through the narcissist's gaze. Mm -hmm. The narcissist idealizes her. And then he, gives, he provides her with access to this idealization. And then she falls in love with her own idealized image. It's intoxicating. It's exactly what happens to a baby with his mother. The mother idealizes the baby. And the baby gains access to his nascent self, to his emerging self, mm. through the mother's gaze. So initially, the baby's self is idealized and that's why all babies are narcissists mm. they're narcissists mm. because the mother the mother idealizes them and then they come to believe this they come to create a self around this idealization and that allows them to take on the world to explore the world this is the sequence the mother idealizes the baby the baby feels godlike mm. the baby feels idealized and now he can take on the world because he's god it's a critical, healthy feature of early childhood. The mother's gaze is crucial in pushing the child away from her and into the world. It's as, as if the mother is saying, listen, baby, you are God. You are ideal. You don't need me. You don't need me anymore. You can take mm -hmm. on the world. Go ahead. Take on the world. And the child begins to explore the world and then discovers that there are other people in the world and develops object relations, ability mm -hmm. to interact with other people. This is all very crucial. What the narcissist does, he takes himself and his partner 
and he regresses both of them to age two prior to this stage of separation individuation and they become enmeshed they become a single unit codependent and, and trauma bonded is that the is that the kind of phraseology we would use that, that, that they're creating their own trauma and bonding themselves together trauma bond is is a controversial and misunderstood concept mm. um Layman thing, the trauma bonding is that you bond with the narcissist because he has a capacity to traumatize you mm. and then the capacity to, to reconcile with you. Mm. Intermittent reinforcement, black and uh, hot and cold. You know? So the narcissist loves you and then the narcissist hates you, but he has a capacity to love you. So you become addicted to this cycle. You say, mm. he hates me now, he's aggressive, he's violent. I need to get his love back. But I need to get it. I will get his love. Mm. Not that I need to get his love. I know that I will because intermittent reinforcement is the pattern of the relationship. So mm. if I wait long enough, I'll get the love back. Mm. And there's no love like it, as I just said. This is the kind of love that a mother has for mm. the baby. It's unconditional. It's all oceanic. Consuming. It's oceanic. Mm. It's all consuming. Exactly. So, mm. so it's worth waiting for. So this is the layman's interpretation of trauma bonding. But the truth is that it's, it's a much deeper and seriously pernicious phenomenon. Because what the narcissist does, he triggers your, your other traumas. He triggers previous traumas. Mm. He, he pushes the buttons, the trauma buttons in you. And because he's the one to push the trauma buttons, he acquires omnipotence over you. Only he has the power. His finger is on the button. Mm. Only he has the power to remove it. And you want him to remove yeah. it more than anything. Many, many victims are actually there. They remain there. Not necessarily because they expect the narcissist's love or they can't live without it or they're addicted to it. But as a form of pain relief. It's, it's, it's the only person who can take away the pain is my narcissist. Or if the other partner is also grandiose, the only person who can restore my grandiosity is my narcissistic partner. Mm. So it's a restorative function in many ways. And so, I think, sorry, go ahead. Mm. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I think I think we have a good understanding, right, of of it, and I think we have a good understanding from a a female perspective of what to look out for. I think the alacrity thing is very very interesting as well. I hadn't considered that the speed at which the narcissist, the male narcissist will move this relationship process forward. This is something really for women to look out for, right? As well as the other things we touched on. Now let's reverse this and let's talk about men, a young man. He's meets a girl, you know, he wants to, he finds her amazing. What should he, is, should he be looking out for the same things or is there are subtle differences, subtle nuances here? The it's, a good, it's a good question. The warning signs with the male narcissist is essentially about control. Right. Control, power, power plays, a symmetry yeah. of power, and so on. Mm. The warning signs with the female... So before I, before I answer your, your question, well into, well into the 2000s, 75% of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder were men. And even today in the text of the DSM-5 text revision published one year ago, it still says that 50 to 75% are men. The truth in the field is that half of all people diagnosed with personality disorders, uh, narcissistic personality disorder, nowadays they're women. Mm. Women have caught up with men. Mm. And women have caught up with men because women have become men. This is not some buckling. These are studies by Lisa Wade and many others, which have proven, again, I think very conclusively, that women have adopted the male stereotypical gender role and have become men in the gender sense, mm -hmm. not in the genitalia sense or the biological sense. Or, they've become men in the it's functional It's performative. It's performative. It's performative. Exactly. Yeah. Gender, gender is performative. Mm. So they perform as men, exactly. But it's not only perform as men, 
they regard themselves as men. For example, this famous study conducted in 1980 and then again in 2020, and mm. women were asked to describe themselves. In 1980, they chose eight out of nine adjectives which were typically stereotypically feminine, caring, empathic, you know, soft. Kind. In soft. 2020, mm. they chose eight out of nine adjectives which were typically stereotypically masculine. Strong, tough, tough strong, yeah. competitive, yeah. ambitious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not only performative. Their self-perception has become utterly masculine. Why am I mentioning this? Consequently, a masculine disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, is now universal because mm -hmm. everyone is a man. Even women are men. So they, they've acquired male mental health disorder. Additionally, the distinctions that used to exist in the 80s and distinctions I wrote about in the 90s, for example, between the manifestations of pathological narcissism in women and in men, these distinctions have all but evaporated. Mm -hmm. Male and female narcissists behave identically, with one exception. And that exception is what is known as histrionic exception. So male narcissists are controlling and antisocial. Controlling and antisocial. Female narcissists are controlling, less antisocial than men, and they're histrionic. When I say histrionic, they place an emphasis on the way they look, appearance rather than substance, for example. Mm. They minimize their intellectual and academic accomplishments. They act hyper emotional, and even to some extent, slutty. The raunch, the raunch culture. You know. mm. uh, so they would emphasize hyper emotionality, external appearance, hypersexuality as well. Hypersexuality, definitely. There would be teas. There would be teasers. Mm -hmm. The chase, sexual chase, uh, and so on. So they would introduce sex and looks into the equation in a way which, in principle, should make you feel uncomfortable. Either because you feel hunted. Mm -hmm. or because the superficiality and artificiality of this behavior is so evident and so pathetic that it's bloody embarrassing. So these mm -hmm. are, so all the signs of the male plus histrionic behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But women narcissists would act identical to the men when it comes to decision-making, alacrity and all these, they would act identical. They would just add to it uh, ostentatious sexuality. Actually, we discovered in studies that women with histrionic personality disorder and women with narcissistic personality disorder do not like sex at all. And they rarely consummate. They are far stronger on chasing and teasing. But when it comes to the sex itself, they try to avoid it or <laughs> run away or... Or Would that be indicative of some kind of developmental or childhood trauma or no, potentially? A... No, manipulative instrument. It's Machiavellian. Mm. It's totally, it's, it's, I agree that it's instinctual and mm. possibly unconscious to some extent, but uh, Machiavellian in effect to manipulate. Similarly, women with histrionic and narcissistic personality disorder misjudge the depth of relationships. They regard relationships as far more intimate than they are. And this is the element of alacrity in women. Mm. So the male narcissist would focus on planning. Let's buy an apartment. Let's go. Let's cohabit. Let's have children. Let's get married. He would focus on the logistics, the mm. mechanics of the shared fantasy. The women would focus, the women narcissist would be equally speedy Equally, equal crazy, crazy making, but they would focus on, on the emotional aspects, the intimate aspects, and they would misjudge. So in men, in men, we have something called sexual overperception. Mm. Men misjudge female behavior, almost all female behavior, and they think it's an invitation for sex. This is called sexual overperception. In female narcissists and female histrionics, we have intimacy over perception. 
because they think that man is in love with them within a single meeting and so on, they want to get married and have nine children on the second date, but not for the same reasons as the male. The male wants to own, wants to own the intimate partner. The female narcissist wants the intimacy, to secure the intimacy, because intimacy is, is translated in the mind of the female narcissist. Int intimacy is translated as power, mm. narcissistic supply, accomplishment. Mm. He's mm. addicted to me. He's my slave. He can't live without me. These are women phrases. These are female phrases. Um, a man can say, you know, she never had sex like that. I'm the best. I'm the best in bed. But he would never say, for example, I don't know, she can't live without me. It's, it's not a, a male expression. Mm, 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 it's a female mm, thing. Mm, mm, mm. But as you can see, these are nuances because ultimately it comes comes to the same. Mm. Both the man and the woman would press for an abnormal pace of relational development. Mm. For different reasons, but comes to the same. Both of them would try to control you. Both of them would make decisions. Both of them would, would disrespect your boundaries. Both of them would ignore your agency and autonomy or try to repress it violently and aggressively if you mm. show any signs. Both of them would use a shared fantasy, absolutely. The, the female narcissist would fantasize about the intimacy dimension of the relation. We're going to have a family, we're going to be very happy, we have children. The male narcissist would do the same, but he would fantasize on having a trophy wife or having children that he can then shape and mold in his own, in his own, you know. Yeah, I mean, the, the trophy wife is obviously a reflection of his own prowess as well, because the more beautiful physically, the more admiration she's going to get from other males and so you bask if you're a narcissist in the glory of the look what, what belongs to me that's mine so that's what i said co-idealization yeah. co-idealization yeah, yeah. is if you are the owner the proud owner yeah. of an ideal object means you are ideal yeah if you own a drop dead gorgeous hyper intelligent super rich woman you mm -hmm. own her in the narcissist mm -hmm. mind he owns her if you're the owner of this device thing mm -hmm. object Mm. then that makes you godlike, ideal. Mm. It's exactly like a status symbol. You know, and you the, corresponding, the corresponding thing on the female side then is she kind of owns him because he can't live without her. Yes, he's a slave he's, to her. He's yeah. addicted to her. He's addicted he's to her. He's a drug. Her. Yeah. yeah. She's irresistible. Mm -mm -mm. Which means she has secured, in many ways, her own future and her children's future. If he's addicted to her, She's re secured a resource provider for the rest of her natural life in, in, in some ways. Most modern women don't think don't that way anymore. Yeah. Actually, mm. they're trying to avoid long-term commitments and, and so on. Mm. Uh, very few want children and many of them refuse to cohabit or to get married. No, it's controlling an object. The same way you buy mm. a car. If you buy a mm. Porsche tomorrow or whatever, you're going to brag. Yeah, You're going to show it off. Mm. So here she is. She owns a man. And here he is, he owns a woman. Mm. And he idealizes the external aspects of the woman, and she would idealize the internal aspects of the man. Mm. His capacity for intimacy, his love. Mm. And he would idealize her looks. Her mm. That's fascinating. And I think we've given people um, some very good clues there, okay, uh, about what to look out for to avoid. Um, narcissist, can I ask you one more, one more thing on the narcissism piece as as it relates to yes, yes. behavior, right? So, um, imagine you're um, you're in a corporate environment, right, and you you suspect that the people you're working for, the authority figures, are your boss, your immediate boss, your team leader. This is pathological narcissism. We've already established there's a per perfectly possible chance that he or she is. What steps do you take? Are you talking about removing yourself from that situation, from that environment? Or how would you deal with that narcissist? How would you deal with that person? The advice, because narcissists impose a shared fantasy in all types of relationships, not mm. only intimates, not only mm. intimate, but in friendships, in the workplace, in church, in mm. the army, you name it. Mm. Whenever the narcissist comes across someone who can serve as a source of supply or someone who can serve as a an intimate partner of some kind, 
Mm. The Gnostic imposes a shared fantasy. And in the shared fantasy, he is God and you are the worshiper. Mm. The shared fantasy is in control and you are coerced in the shared fantasy. So the principles are identical in all the... So the advice is the same. Mm. No contact. No contact is a set of 27 strategies that I designed yeah. in 1995. And yeah. it's still the best advice there is. The second best advice, if you cannot go no contact, you have children yeah. with a narcissist, you can't lose your job for some reason, you can't move away from... So if the second best advice, which is not something I came up with, I regret okay. to say, but it's a great advice, is gray rock. To gray rock means to render yourself uninteresting to the narcissist. Mm. A bad source of narcissistic supply because you're stupid. Mm. Or you are incapable of curiosity. Mm. You're, you're not a not, worthy adversary. Not a worthy object to be owned. Mm. Narcissists don't have adversaries. They're God. Mm. What do you mean? What adversaries? Mm. They're not adversaries. They're God. Mm. Some contemptible inferior people may consider themselves to be the narcissist's adversary, adversary or enemy. Mm. But it's because they're deluded. Mm. Hey, they realize the omnipotence, omniscience, and perfection of the narcissist, they would have never considered themselves were, uh, his enemies, because to be an enemy, you need to be equal somehow. Mm -hmm. So not, no, not as an enemy, but as a, um, as a object to be on. So if you are a rock, so you have great. to minimize your, the problem here, Sam, is if, if you're in a corporate uh, environment, and I have worked in a few, um, don't attract but, attention to yourself. Yeah, minimize basically. yourself, mm. hide yourself. I mean, Robert Greene talks about this in the 48 Laws of Power as well, about never um, upsta upstaging the, 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 the master. Um, that's essentially the, is, is what you're talking if about. You're there. Compelled, you minimize you're yourself. Compelled to stay. Yeah. You're forced to stay. No. Yeah. No, the, my first advice is to disconnect, resign. Disconnect, yeah. Resign, literally. Yeah. Because it can end really bad. It can what, end really what, badly yeah. and can affect your future career. Mm. Narcissists, if they are mortified, narcissists can be narcissistically injured. Mm. It's when you challenge, undermine their grandiosity in some way, mm. their self perception or self image, mm. you cause them uh, discomfort by doing this. But they can also be mortified. Mm. Mortification, narcissistic mortification, is if you shame the narcissist, inadvertently even, mm. in public. The oh, narcissist yeah. is giving a presentation. Mm. And you raise your hand and say, I'm sorry, but this slide is wrong. Mm. You've shamed him in public. That's mortification. Mm. You have become his mortal, his mortal enemy. Well, he doesn't have enemies, but you, you become something to be quashed and crushed mm. and destroyed forever and ever. Amen. Confined to the outer oblivion of mm. deep space. He's going to pursue you. He's going to pursue you for years. He's going to pursue you in all future careers. He's got, narcissists are exceedingly vindictive. Mm -hmm. when they're exposed to mortification. And mm -hmm. this is known as the external solution of mortification. It was first described by Libby, not by me, by Libby. Mm -hmm. So when a narcissist is shamed or humiliated in public, in front of an audience that matters to him, yeah, he's going to ruin your life period. It's going to mm -hmm. be, he's going to focus on this. This is going to be his laser yeah. focus. So mm -hmm. it could end extremely badly. And uh, the, the danger is in any environment, whether it's an academic environment or in a work environment, if you want to engage and you want to ask questions and you, you're curious, you're all, you, you could put your foot on a grenade, metaphorically, yes. with a narcissist very easily. Yes, and unfortunately, the incidence and prevalence of narcissism, pathological mm. narcissism, is increasing. Mm. These yeah. are study, studies by Twenge and Campbell, the newer generations, people under mm. the age of 25 under the age of 30 by now. They're much more narcissistic. They're five times more narcissistic. Do you think social media is fueling narcissism? Do you no, think... I think it's the opposite. Social media caters to narcissism. Okay. I think social media is a reaction to narcissistic needs. Yeah. But I think uh, the restructuring of society um, enhances or rewards narcissism. Mm. For example, people are now self-sufficient. Mm. Technology rendered them self-sufficient. Technology is also some kind of womb, a matrix, if you wish, mm. because technology is, is all-encompassing, all-engulfing, all-pervasive, the internet of everything. 
Mm. And technology provides instant solutions. And in this sense, technology is omnipotent, is omniscient, it's like God is, is godlike. Mm. So if you own technology, if you control technology, remember core idealization. If you own technology, then you are as good as technology. And if technology mm. is godlike, then you're godlike. That's why everyone in his dog nowadays is an expert about everything. Mm. People argue with medical doctors and with professors and with why? Because they have access to Wikipedia. Mm. Mm. So well, they say a little knowledge is an expert. thing, right? Sorry? A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. The, the, the classic phrase in, in, in English language, a little knowledge yes, is a dangerous thing because it, it gives the, 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 the purveyor of that knowledge um, a feeling of power. Yes, I think, I think there is a phenomenon that I call malignant egalitarianism. Mm. Malignant egalitarianism, we are all equal. We are all equal by virtue to, to having possessing access to the same resources. Mm. So you can surf the Wikipedia, I can surf Wikipedia, we're equal. Mm. And so people would not hesitate to argue with me about diagnosis that I invented. Mm. And they would tell me that I don't understand the diagnosis. Mm. And I better watch this and this. He knows mm -hmm. better or she knows better. And that's the diagnosis that I invented. Mm. And so technology em empowers people in the wrong sense and renders them more narcissistic. That's for sure. But I think technology was a reaction to the rising tide of narcissism. Mm. And we're going to see more and more and more and more narcissistic technologies because narcissism is a vicious, vicious uh, cycle, vicious circle. Mm. It is it is self-generating, self-assembling, and self-empowering. In short, the more narcissists there are, the more they structure society so as to reward narcissism. And the more narcissism is rewarding, the more narcissists there are. It's a it's a it's a feedback loop. Loop, yeah. Self-reinforcing feedback. Do you know in, in July 2016, New Scientist, yeah. a science magazine in the United yeah. Kingdom, as you know, New Scientist came up with a cover story, yeah. July 2016. And the cover story said, uh, parents, teach your children to be narcissists. Mm. Yeah. That's where we are. Well, 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 well I mean, uh, yeah, I was going to ask you about that, this helicopter parenting stuff. Um where children are not being exposed to any challenges. There was another thing I, I was reading this morning. I was actually watching, it was about council culture. Um, over 200 professors have been counseled in the United States um, in the last 20 years. Um, a, a colleague of Jonathan Heights was talking about this, this phenomenon. And it's a greater number of professors that have been counseled than all, than all that were counseled during McCarthyism in the 1950s. Um, what's your perspective on dark triad council culture uh what's happening in society do you think there's there's elements of narcissism there the sociologist bradley said that uh bradley campbell mm. said that we have trans we have transitioned from the age of dignity to the age of victimhood victimhood has become not only an organizing principle and a hermeneutic principle principle that explains life makes mm. sense of life but also an identity determinant and consequently part of identity politics. Mm. The problem with victimhood is this. If everyone is a victim, there's a problem to find who is victimized. Yeah. When you're a victim, you are compelled to find a victimizer. Even if there's no victimizer, even if your victimhood is self-imputed, mm. you would still work very hard to find a victimizer because the narrative would be incomplete mm. and ridiculous. You mm. rise if, if if you don't find a victimizer soon. So the studies in Israel in 2020, four studies in Israel in 2020, other studies in British Columbia, mm. and, and recent studies in China and elsewhere, they're beginning to demonstrate, I think convincingly, that victimhood movements are infiltrated by narcissists and psychopaths who then take over and leverage victimhood movement, movements in two ways yeah. to obtain attention. It's a power and grab. And it's a power grab to penalize, mm. to sadistically use mm. the power to penalize, to coerce, not necessarily with a goal orientation, 
but to coerce is a performative action, mm. as, a, as a demonstration. To coerce ostentatiously. It's like a deterrent, if you wish. So many, many victimhood movements have been taken over by Nazis and psychopaths. Online, we have the empaths movement. Mm. There's no such thing as empath. It's clinical nonsense. These people are grandiose. Many of them are covert narcissists, I have no doubt. And yet they pose as these angelic, blemishless, faultless victims mm. who have been passively victimized by narcissists through no fault or contribution of their own. It's a classic splitting defense. I'm all good. The narcissist is all bad. I'm an angel. He's a demon. Mm. And many of them go to that extent. They say that narcissists uh, have been possessed by demons. Don't ask. Or mm. So it's an example of a victimhood movement which started off by me, by the way, started off by me when I established support groups of victims of narcissistic abuse and then metastasized and mutated into a narcissism controlled environment of ostentatious, declared, competitive victimhood, mm. thereby demonizing uh, the alleged abuser. This is an example in narcissism, but you have the same example in race, mm. the same example in, in love. When you, when you have spotted the abuser, mm. when you have spotted the abuser, you need to demonstrate your power. It's part of the narcissistic psychopathic ma uh, matrix. Uh, rule book, you need to demonstrate your power. Deterrence in, in international affairs. Yeah. And, and you did mention that the vindictiveness aspect of it as well, yes. that there is a vindictive quality to the destruction of somebody's reputation and, and very often their career for yes. the most minor, sometimes agree, uh, of offense. Um, yes, it accomplishes several, several goals. You demonstrate your power, so you mm. intimidate others. Mm. You punish vindictively and visibly and conspicuously, so you you have restored your grandiosity. Mm. This is a grandiosity restoring mechanism, mm. and um, you may even have converted people to the cause by doing this. So it's, there's a missionary aspect mm. to this, and this is true, for example, with me too, as well, because you, you're mentioning cancel. Cancel mm. culture. That's yeah. one aspect. <clears throat> but the Me Too movement, is, in my view, has mutated and metastasized. And today it's a vindictive, narcissistic, I would say psychopathic movement. Absolutely. Which is hell-bent on transforming or reversing the power matrix or power parallel parallelogram between men and women. So a chauvinistic um, movement that is the equivalent of the alleged patriarchy. <laughs> it, 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 there are, people talk about elements of misandry. Misan, um, misandry, yes. Yeah. Out of it, yes. So uh, that's another example. Race, race relations, the same. It's bad. It's a bad situation because these movements start off in well. the academy, they start in the they they they, they, were, they were meant the ideas that were meant to stay within the academy, places for discussion. It's legitimate, and it's legitimate for an idea to exit academy and, and yeah. This all these movements, almost without a single exception, started off with good intentions. They were yeah. authentic. They represented real well grievances. Meaning. Yeah, real grievances. And I mean, women have been abused in corporate settings in the entertainment and the industry. No one is disputing this, and so on. Mm. So they started off well. But then they've been hijacked by Nazis and psychopaths. And Nazis and psychopaths couldn't care less who is a victim and who is not, mm. as long as they are the abusers. Now these movements are abusive. Mm. Victimhood movements and victimhood identity politics are absolutely abusive, coercive, psychopathic, antisocial, and narcissistic. Period. That's not some Vakni. These mm. are the recent academic studies. Mm. It is telling that these studies are not much more well known. No, they're Better. not. Um, can you point to one uh, off the top of your head? Gabay, Gabay in Israel, G-A-B-A-Y, and her colleagues, four studies, not one. Yeah. Gabay and her colleagues. There are others. I have, um, I have um, um, 
a series of uh, uh, videos about victimhood movements on my yeah. channel. Yeah. And in the description, you have literature. Yeah. You can find more. Um, last question, Sam. Obviously, Israel-Palestine is the horror that's taking place. There is a video on your, your channel, a fascinating video about narcissism. What's your What's your perspective on the... The, the codependent, you, you, you kind of t touch on the codependency of Israel and Palestine and the kind of narcissistic um, intertwined relationship. Can you expand on that? I think it's a perfect example of two victimhood movements mm -hmm. hijacked by narcissists and psychopaths, apropos our last <laughs> segment, mm -hmm. at each other's throats and loggerheads, fighting over scarce resources, the land, Israel, Palestine, mm. fighting over scarce resources, but no less, no less importantly, fighting over grievances and the satisfaction of grievances in a visible ostentatious manner, which includes the humiliation and, if possible, decimation and decapitation of the of the enemy, mm. of the other, not the enemy, but the other. So, the Hamas. The Hamas-Israel uh, interlude, the latest chapter, the latest episode. This has been going on since 1882, by the way. Mm. So the latest episode encapsulates perfectly these dynamics that we've been discussing. Narcissism, psychopathy, victimhood, and so on and so forth. Both parties are grievance-based grievance movements. Zionism is a grievance-based movement. It, it started with the pogroms in Russia and accomplished the state of Israel after the Holocaust. And to this very day, the Holocaust is quite an industry, an industry of self-pity and grievances, and not denying the Holocaust, a horrendous event, genocide, you name it. But it's been leveraged time and again. The same with the Palestinians. They have grievances. The colonization of Palestine by, by the Jews, never mind that Palestine was half empty, and, but okay, the colonization of Palestine. Um, the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, where Palestinians have been allegedly expelled, untrue, only some of them were expelled. The majority of Palestinians left voluntarily. It's founded on lies. On both sides, it's founded on lies. Similarly, the Jews are lying, about, the Israelis are lying about many things. These are by now totally psychopathic narcissistic movements, which have nothing in common with the original movements. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Hamas is a malignant mutation of, uh, of the Palestinian national movement. Malignant mutation. Reminiscent of the, in the, of the 1930s and 40s, when the Palestinians supported the Nazis. And um, Israel's brand of Zionism nowadays is infused with, with uh, grandiosity, sense of contempt and superiority, and so on and so forth. It's me one mental illness fighting the other. Uh, unfortunately, this leads to real life outcomes. People die, they're massacred, they're raped, they're decapitated. They are, I mean, real things are happening. Mm. Self-delusionality, self-deception, this fantastic space that I've mentioned before, they lead to real-world outcomes. For example, Israel has announced that its goal, its aim, is to eradicate and eliminate Hamas. That is a fantasy goal. There's no chance in hell of eliminating or eradicating Hamas. Because Hamas is super popular among the Palestinian population. It's a grassroots thing. Unless you kill all the Palestinians, it's very unlikely that Hamas will disappear. This is not ISIS. ISIS was hated. ISIS was hated and loathed by the local populations. It imposed itself on the local population. Hamas is mm -hmm. not the same. In 2022, the, the, there is a study we have, and uh, a poll that was done in 2022 that indicated 58% of Palestinians in Gaza uh, supported Hamas. Yes, 50, uh, 53% in 2021, 31% mm. in, in a bit later, 
there was some problem then. And now it's back to 50 something. Yeah. Mm. It's like Viet Cong in Vietnam. The United States threw everything it had, with the exception of hydrogen bombs. Everything it had. And nothing didn't work. It's not going to work with Hamas. Mm. The minute you live in fantasy, your goals are unrealistic. Grandiosity cognitively distorts your perception. You make bad decisions, which end up in loss of life and property, of course, but loss of life. Grandiosity on both sides will will be the, the... What I'm hearing from you is there has to be a political settlement, essentially. It, it can't be a military settlement. It has to be political. It's an unsolvable situation. Mm. I'm sorry to say. The only two solutions we, we can conceive of are two states or one state. Mm. If you accept the one state solution, and incorporate millions of Palestinians into a United States of Israelis and Palestinians, they will have become the majority shortly, 2040, 2050, depending. And then either you accept that they are the majority and you cease to be a Jewish state, or you rule over them as second-class citizens and you end up being a variant of South Africa. Mm -hmm. That's a one-state solution. This two-state mm -hmm. solution requires a connection between the West Bank and Gaza, and Gaza. Mm -hmm. that traverses the territory of Israel and cuts mm -hmm. it in half. Mm -hmm. I can't see Israel accepting this anytime soon or ever, <laughs> honestly. Mm -hmm. It's also a nonsensical solution. They were fanciful about ideas about building a metro between Gaza and, and, and um... I think it was East, wasn't there some kind of underground tunnel they were going to build between Gaza and West Bank? Terrorist, terrorist cross tunnels underground, mm. as Israel is now discovering. 300 kilometers of them, apparently. Uh, yeah. Terrorists um, use roads, they cross tunnels, they use the air. The problem is coexistence, not mm. the infrastructure. Mm. There is no trust between these two people because they've been fighting for 150 years. A two-state solution requires trust. Mm. If Israel controls the corridor between the West Bank and Gaza, then it's not a state. Mm. And if it is a sovereign state, Israel cannot control this corridor and can never mm. be sure when the next October 7 is going to happen. This is, these two solutions are nonsensical. The two parties, which is very typical of narcissistic, psychopathic victimhood movements, mm. they are absolute. Mm. They don't brook compromise. They, if you talk to a, to a member of Black Lives Matter, it's black and white. Mm -hmm. If you talk to Me Too, every man is a rapist. They don't, mm -hmm. there's, there's no middle ground. It's splitting. It's black and white thinking. It's what we call dichotomous thinking. It's sick. Mm -hmm. It's a pathological defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. So uh, the two parties, Israelis and Palestinians, they have maximalist positions. They want 100% of the land. The Palestinians say from the river, it's Jordan, sea. to the mm. sea, which means expanding the all the, Israel, all the Jews Israel, back yeah. to mm. Europe. Mm. And the Jews say transfer the population to other countries, to Jordan mainly. So these are, the only solution here is ethnic cleansing. Mm. To be, <laughs> is the only solution here. But of course, mm. in today's world, in the 21st century, even Russia doesn't dare to ethnically cleanse Ukraine, which it could do easily. Mm. No one does that anymore. So, it's and, and it's it's psychopathic, for want of a better term. Um, but the only the only the only way forward is is, is political. Um, that's 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 what I'm hearing from you as well. Uh, there can't be no way forward. I don't think there's a way forward. No, that's not what you're hearing. Mm. I will, uh, you see, this is an American mindset. Mm. Every disease is a cure. Every mm. problem is a solution. Mm. That's the American malignant optimism. Mm. No, some problems don't have a solution. I would mm. even go further because I'm a bit older than you. I'm 62. Mm. Some pro most problems don't have a solution. Most diseases don't have a cure. Mm. And most mental illnesses cannot be healed, only managed. This war that, will go on, this war will go on indefinitely. Rome mm. Rome 
uh, was fighting for a thousand years. Sorry, let me just add two sentences to uh, your last question. Oh yeah, go, yeah. The Palestinians regard Israel as an aberration, a historical aberration. Mm. They, they see Israel as the modern reincarnation of the Crusader states. Crusader states have lasted for 200 years. Mm. And the Palestinians say, we have 200 years. We have a thousand years. We have as long as it takes. Numerically, we outweigh the Israelis. We have a much higher reproduction rate. Mm. And sooner or later, you know, they won't be able to cope with the numbers, by sheer force of numbers. And there is also this perception that peace is the equilibrium state or the homeostatic state of international affairs. That's mm. not true historically, of course. Mm. War is. Mm. There have been polities, there have been political entities in history who have, uh, which have survived for hundreds of years in a state of war with all their neighbors. Example was, of course, China. Mm -hmm. The Chinese wall was erected because China has had hundreds of years of conflict with the Mongols. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Rome survived for a thousand years, maybe longer, in a state of war, uninterrupted war. And the United States is such a polity. The United States didn't have a single year, check it out, I know there war. are more wars. They've had they they fought so many wars in their history that it's 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 shocking. You can even it's, it's Wikipedia every year. this. Yeah. Literally every year. Mm. And when the and then they invented wars like Grenada and what every year. So there are belligerent polities that mm. survive well and prosper and thrive mm. in a constant state of war. They have a military that is a standing military. Mm. which later becomes involved in politics, like in Rome, like in Israel. Most of the politicians are ex-military. Mm. It's a militarized entity. And I don't see any reason why Israel couldn't survive another two, three, four, five hundred thousand years uh, in a state of war with the Palestinians. Israel doesn't have a nuclear weapon, nuclear weapons. That's something to consider. Any existential threat on Israel would trigger these weapons. Everyone knows this. Everyone knows this. Israel will not hesitate to wipe mm -hmm. half the Arab world and any Iran into the bargain. Should it think that it's about to, you know, as Russia said in Ukraine, if we are faced with an existential threat, we use our, our nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons change the equation dramatically, actually. Yeah, you can fight in the margins. You can kill a thousand here, 10,000 there. When push comes to shove, you have a nuclear weapon. Yeah, let's uh, let's assume that option is just not on the table. The, the threat no. of it is always there, but the use of it, no, of course not. In, 20, no yeah. in 2023, just wouldn't. I mean, it would just be inconceivable. Um, so what you're, what I'm hearing from you, Sam, is that you you see this this war as almost never ending. It, it's the, you cannot see. It's intractable. The whole, the rest of the world is going to be going to be watching this play out for the next five hundred years. They I mean, did, they did with Rome. They did with the, with the United Kingdom. They did mm -hmm. with the, with the United States. Why not with uh, Israel? You it's, know, we, not, we, it's not the exception to the rule. It's the mm -hmm. rule. Mm -hmm. Europe has been in a state of constant war mm -hmm. for one thousand four hundred years. Check mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. It ended in nineteen forty five. Mm. There was a war in 1870, there was a war in 1914, there was a war in 1939. <laughs> and mm. prior to that, there were wars in 1638. And I mean, Europe has been 70% of the time in a state of war. Mm. War is normal. Peace is abnormal. Mm. The European Union is a deviant, is, is a deviant, is an aberration. That's why I don't believe that it will survive. Well, it may survive 200 years, 300 years. I'm talking in historical terms. Mm -hmm, I don't mm -hmm. believe we will have a European Union in a thousand years. It's not doable. This is not mm. how humans think and behave. Mm. Well, the, uh, the the human development of AI may, may take us out long before the Union, the European Union um, uh, <laughs> gets gets destroyed or or, 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 or disappears. 
Um, one last question. The future of the study of cluster B personalities, what does the future hold? What do you see coming down the track? Can you see anything in terms of AI, in terms of what, what's your perspective on what the future holds? First and foremost, it, the whole concept of personality disorder mm. must be discarded because mm. personality is a bizarre entity that no one quite understands. Mm. Similarly, the individual, the self, mm. all the language of psychology is utterly fantastic, mm. not founded on any studies, counterfactual, total myth, narrative, storytelling, nothing to do with anything resembling remotely a science, not even botany. You know? So we need to get rid of these language elements because they hinder our consciousness. They, they prevent us from thinking properly. Mm. In the field of cluster B, we need to realize that cluster B, these are not personality disorders as much as post-traumatic reactions. Mm. And that's not only me, of course. That's Judith Herman, who, who coined the phrase complex PTSD. And complex so PTSD, yeah. Many, many scholars now come, are coming, coming around to this idea. Mm. Why is this important? Because if these are post-traumatic reactions, they're treatable. Mm. If these are personality disorders, they're not treatable. Because you can't treat the personality. Yeah. Mm. But you can treat trauma. We know how. Mm. So the, that's the first thing. Recon reconceiving of them as post-traumatic. Second thing, the role of dissociation is very critical. Dissociation, identity, memory. This, mm. this dimension has been neglected, seriously, heavily neglected in the literature and studies and so on and so forth. It is arguable whether there is anyone there. There, in object relations in the 1960s in the United Kingdom, they were talking, they used to talk about empty schizoid core. And to this very day, emptiness is a diagnostic criterion of borderline personality disorder. But I don't think it's emptiness, or not in this sense. It's not like a vacuum, a black hole. It's simply discontinuity, disjointedness, inability to form a core which relies or is comprised of memories because of too many memory gaps, mm. dissociative reactions, and so on. It's a trauma. It's a post-traumatic response. So mm. the role of dissociation. The third element is realizing that people transition between what we call today personality disorders all the time. We are now beginning to realize that borderline may be a form of psychopathy in women. We are beginning to conceive of narcissism, some type of narcissism, overt, grandiose narcissism, as mm -hmm. a form of psychopathy. We are beginning to see overt types I, I just suggested a new diagnosis of covert borderline. We begin to see covert types and overt types. Mm -hmm. We are beginning to realize the role of collapse. Collapse is when the basic needs, the basic maintenance needs of the personality are not met. In the case of narcissists, narcissistic supply. He cannot obtain supply. And so he collapses. The collapse is very important psychodynamically because it is the transitional phase from one type to another. So there's no type constancy, there's, con there's flux. And if we accept that everything is in flux and everything is a mirror image of everything else and everything is a flip side of the coin, which has multiple sides or whatever, mm. if we accept all this, then we need to begin to discuss how these transitions happen. How do they occur? So we need to discuss triggers and constructs. We need a much more flexible framework. And I'm adopting now the framework of Philip Bromberg. Philip Bromberg suggested at the time, there's no such thing as a unitary self. There are self states. And the self states are reactive to the to cues from the environment. Mm. So I'm developing this, this work. People are not like a pond. They're not like a lake. They're like a river. You cannot step into the same person twice. So we need something which is kaleidoscopic, something which is, you know, on, on a dime, something that's very reactive, something flowing. And I think that's the future of not only cluster B, of psychology mm -hmm. in general. Understanding the fluidity of 
of, of a person as opposed to the immutable. Um, Professor Sam Vaknin, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, and amazing. I apologize if I've been abrasive or antisocial or both. But, but I like it. I like it. I like the abrasiveness and I like the, um, the directness. Um, and I think there's a substantial amount of really, really fascinating stuff in here. And uh, thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate thank you. it. I will upload the raw material. You will upload the final version. So yeah. that we don't compete. No Is problem. okay with you? That's no problem at all. You do whatever. I just want to pause it here. Recording pause. Brilliant. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. Great. But what do you want? Why don't you, can you edit out the little bit where I go to the bathroom? Yeah, yeah, I will take that up. And maybe the little bit where I, um, I'm going to... Oh, it's one. authentic. It's authentic. People like it. I know, I know. People, people love viral. the authenticity of it. Yeah, they do. Um, I might edit out just a little two seconds where you call me a bit of an idiot um, for, for not... Um, for not... Remember, remember the piece about... No, I don't think I, don't think I used it. No, you name. didn't call me an idiot, but you said, you know, the piece about where you said... Um, are you I talking about... with you harshly, but I, didn't, harshly, I don't harshly. think I called you an idiot. I don't know. I look back in it, but otherwise it's... I'm going to put the whole thing up as is, with a little bit of an intro, a little bit of an outro, and then I'm going to do a couple of shorts as well for the social stuff. And then I might do a little 10-minute 10, 10 piece, because I want my Jewish-Israeli friend to ask me to ask you what girls should look out for, and I want to put that into a little 10-minute piece for girls. Right? Just let me know about all these things, and I'll promote them on my social media. Yeah, yeah, I'd appreciate that. I'd appreciate okay. that. Okay. Um, brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It was Take lovely care. talking to you. Thank you. Nice talk, talk to you soon. Take care. Let's do it again sometime. Bye-bye. Well, pleasure. Bye -bye. You're not an idiot. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> Thank you.